What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode five of the Unite Asia podcast. My name is Riz. Let's get right into the news. What do we have going on? Let's see. Down in Indonesia, amazing hardcore band called Fingerprint from Midan. They are about to release a new album on Disaster Records. Disaster Records has been busy, man. They've been doing a lot of stuff this year. Good for them. We also have Malaysian Screamo Band. They're Piri Rise. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing their name right. Piri Rise. P-I-R-I, Piri, and Rise, R-E-I-S. They can correct me in the comments down below. But they're about to release their debut album, which is interesting. Their debut album is going to come out, and the band has actually just announced uh, maybe a couple months ago that they're breaking up. The other interesting thing is this band has been super active for years, I feel like. They've toured everywhere, released great, amazing things. But this record coming up is their debut album. Had no idea. Next, our friends in Vanilla Thunder Records from Singapore had just announced a split 7-inch with a band called Drug Noose from Cambodia and Gothrop from Korea. But by the time I started filming this, that record's already sold out. So congratulations to all three parties. Vanilla Thunder Records, uh, Korean band Gothrop, and then... Cambodian band Drug News. Next, we have a brand new podcast from Taiwan called Speak Metal or Die. It's available on Spotify, so definitely go check them out. We know what it's like to be a brand new podcast, right? This is already our fifth episode, so we got to spread that love, continue to support, and encourage other people involved in this game. So that's called Speak Metal or Die on Spotify. Check the description down below for that link. <laughs> Next, we get to talk about some of our favorite videos and even some videos or posts that our readers have enjoyed. For me personally, the videos this past week that really caught my attention, one is by a band called Low Vision. They just released an amazing song from their upcoming full length, which will be their last one. And in that video, they just get raw. You have to see this video. The video, I think, I believe is almost only a minute long, but the song doesn't start until like maybe 30 seconds into it or something like that. And when it kicks in, yo, it is so raw. Just got that great punk rock attitude, that hardcore vibe, straight up DIY. It's great. And I, I believe the song is called No Sexism. So the band is even trying to address certain issues within the Japanese hardcore punk scene. So big ups to Low Vision for releasing their last album and for it to have such important topics like that in it. So go check out that video. Also on the hardcore front from Japan, our dudes in NUM just released this killer full set live video. And the video was actually made and put together to support anti knock a killer DIY punk hardcore venue in Tokyo. So you got to check out this video. This has got like multi-cam footage, got great audio. You even have the vocalist Senta walking in from outside into the, to the venue, which is sick. So it looks super cool. And the band just took over the entire venue. They're playing on the floor of the venue. They're not even using the stage. They're on the floor because it's during the COVID crisis. So the audience wasn't uh, allowed to get inside. So the band just took over the whole thing. You guys got to check it out. Another video, which I thought was super sick, is uh, Death of Heather, this great shoegaze band from Thailand. They just put out a, their first song off their upcoming full length that's coming out on Yell's Records in Thailand. It, there's a, a female protagonist in it who's, who looks like she's trying to get over certain things that are going on in her life. And she has a hard time trying to get over it. But eventually, in the middle of that song, she finds the courage to face all these issues that she has. I mean, these are universal topics that all of us can relate to. So Death of Heather from Thailand is just this great shoegaze band that put out this video. And their album is coming out sometime later this year. <laughs> Now, on the reader's front, I was a little late to the game. This morning, I had just released a quick post on our Facebook page. Just said, hey, I'm about to shoot this video later on today. What were some of your favorite posts from this past week? So I didn't really give you guys much time. It was like, I think I gave you like four hours before I started shooting this. And quickly, pretty interesting. The videos and posts that got the most uh, likes on it were from Low Vision, the one I just mentioned, and Num, which I just mentioned. That's pretty cool that we are so on the same wavelength. Another band that was mentioned was a band called Abitur Blues from Singapore who just released a 7-inch and on Dangerous Goods. And that 7-inch, I believe, is almost sold out. If it's not sold out, you better get on it right away. So Abitur Blues is a vegan melodic hardcore band from Singapore. So one of our readers pointed out that was a standout for them. Another standout was for our new demo page that we've got, a demo link on our website. And on that, I just lifted all the demos that come into our inbox. And a person pointed out that, A, they're super excited that there is a demo page now. And B, that 
one of the posts on that page that got him really excited was a Malaysian harsh noise band called Kwai Dan. And they just released a demo. It's killer. It's so noisy. It's so harsh. And in the post, I remember saying, like, when I think of extreme music in 2020, this is what is extreme to me. Not the over-polished metalcore sound and everything is so cl crystal clear. This, to me, is extreme music when it's just so harsh. When you listen to it, there's so much feedback on there. There's so much distortion on the on everything. Distortion on the guitars, the drums, the vocals. So check out this band. It's in the demos page. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, for episode five, we have an interview with an amazing human being named Acha, vocalist of legendary Indonesian hardcore band Straight Answer. In this interview, we talk about quite a lot of things. Of course, we talk about his journey into punk rock and hardcore as a kid growing up in Jakarta. He talks about how in the late 80s, the very first gateway band that he found was a band called Sex Pistols. And then eventually he found his way to bands like Bold and Youth of Today and Gorilla Biscuits, bands that still inspire him today 20 plus years later with his band Straight Answer. He also talks about something that happened to him four years ago. Actually, four years ago, exactly this week, he had a blood clot in his brain. And he needed immediate surgery to drain all the blood out of his brain. Actually, to this day, what happened was he had surgery, immediate surgery. And then a few days after, he had to have a second surgery, which actually removed a part of his skull. So on this part of his brain, uh, this part of his skull, he actually does not have bone there. So what he does is when you see him perform at shows now, he has to wear a helmet just to protect that side of his brain. So we talk about that. We also talk about his, his store called Here to Stay, which is his uh, bread and butter. He lives off of that. And we also talk about other things that are going on in his life. He's had some pretty rough things go on, especially this past summer. And he talks about how he has a motto that he lives by, which is whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger and he really lives by that he's an amazing human being i hope you enjoy this episode thank you acha peace What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode five of the United Asia podcast. Today is a big day because we made it to episode five. And so for episode five, we're going to go big. I call my good friend Acha of legendary Indonesian hardcore band called Straight Answer. Called him yesterday and said, hey, man, I'm, I don't have anyone. Do you, can you make time for tomorrow? He's like, yeah, let me see what I can do. He's like, yeah, no problem. I got your back, man. So today on episode five, we get to interview my good, good friend, Acha of Straight Answer from Indonesia. How are you doing, bro? I'm good, man. I'm good, Riz. Hello, everyone. Hello, Riz. Yeah, good to see you, man. Good to see you, bro. So, Acha, what we'll do is we usually ask our guests to kind of take us back to the history of how they got into hardcore punk. Just so that people outside of Indonesia, outside of Jakarta, outside of uh, Asia maybe, can kind of, kind of get a little bit of a background of how does an Indonesian hardcore kid find his way into hardcore. So can you take us back to how you found hardcore and punk? Um, for me, um, at, at first I bought uh, the Sex Pistols and after that uh, I start, like I read magazines and um, you know my, my kind of um, study was uh, I uh, I read the thanks list on the tape uh, thanks list, so I know oh this is the band that that's the person. So I started to to look for the those bands. So yeah, and then uh, I bought like any tapes like metal metal tapes from Napalm Death, Suffocation stuff like that. And then I started to listen to hardcore in '95 I think, but I didn't but I didn't know the term or the hardcore term was. Because I only bought like tapes like uh, Biohazard, like and then maybe I don't know Circle Jerks. I don't know. I think it was like trash. I think it was just like trash metal. So uh, and then I uh, started to listen to uh, bought CDs from from someone who came from um, US or Europe, and then oh this is hardcore. So I started like uh, looking through the Revelation records or uh, Lost and Found that time. So I sent letters 
and uh, they gave me the catalogs, which is for me, it was amazing to see a lot of bands and um, merchandise and everything. So I started like lots of friends like copying it from me, copied from me, like Xerox, and then gave it to everyone. It's like, wow, this is good, man. Like, oh, this band uh, comes from there and that. So we know a bit about here and there. So we started to like buy CDs, not records, because that time we, we don't have, we didn't have like a record player. We only have, uh, we only have CD players. So, th so this is 90, you said 95, right? 95, 96, yeah. But can I ask you, before you got into even finding Sex Pistols, like when you first started listening to music, did you automatically already know about punk rock or did you start with like, like Michael Jackson or what did you start with? Yeah. I started with the Beatles. Ah. The Beatles. Always. Nice. Always. Yeah, the Beatles made me do it, man. What? <laughs> the Beatles, and then I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Beatles, and then uh, I started listening to the Sex Pistols. Yeah. But how did you find? Because uh, I just try to, so I'm trying to explain to people about what J Jakarta music scene is, and I keep saying the Indonesian music scene is probably the biggest outside of Japan in Asia. Indonesia is so big. So when you were growing up in a, in a Muslim country like Indonesia, how did you find the Beatles? Well, actually, it's because my father and mother uh, taught me about music. Every day, I listen to their music. I listen to Everly Brothers, Bee Gees, Beatles, even Diana Ross, Xerophon, everything. So I started, I, I asked, Dad, who's this? Oh, this is the uh, Bee Gees. And then I asked my mother, uh, Mom, who's this? Oh, this is Diana Ross. Oh. Okay, so I like the Beatles, so I want to buy the, the, the tapes. So yeah, so I started saving, I was in the, there was, I think that was back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Because yeah. you and me are about the same age, so that must have been the 80s. But that's yeah, so I'm cool, bro, that you're, you're, that's so cool that your parents, are your parents Muslim also? Yes. And so they were already listening to Western music? Yes, yeah. Wow, yeah. so open-minded, bro, that's so cool that your parents yeah. are so yeah. open-minded. Yeah, my father, he's a very open-minded person. He's, he's in the Navy. Oh. He's a high-ranked Navy wow. officer. And my mother, she was working at the U.S. Embassy. Wow. And I both, see. yeah, and they are a very good Muslim. We went to Mecca together back in 98. Wow. So that's really cool that your parents can be such a great representation of what Muslims can be like, right? They can be open-minded, they can be very westernized, even if they live in a Muslim country, they can be super just free of all the things that people think, oh, you're a Muslim, you must be this strict, you must be that strict, but you're showing, no, my parents listen to the Bee Gees, they listen to the Beatles, yeah. they're showing me about these bands, that is so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very nice guys. Yeah. Now, so here, I, I, what I would like to know, though, is you can't just automatically find the Sex Pistols, right? Someone must have told you something about this. How did you find Sex Pistols? I think it's, it's like a, a word of mouth. It's like if you like punk music, then you should listen to the Sex Pistols. And then I started, okay, from the metal bands that I listened before, so I know that, oh, from the shirts they are wearing. So, oh, the Sex Pistols, okay because the name is very provocative. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I started digging about them. So that means in Indonesia, in the time that you're talking about, like early 90s, mid 90s, there already was some sort of punk rock scene or community there in Indonesia, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, like, in that time, like, what was the scene like in Indonesia if there already was a punk scene? Well, I mean, there are, like, the guy, like, earlier generation, the guys uh, older than me, they're, like, like metalheads mm. or skaters. So they listen to Suicidal Tendencies, Circle Jerks, Black Flag, late 80s or 90s. Like, a lot of famous skateboarders came to Indonesia to perform. I see. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you were buying your your cassettes and CDs, was it was it easy to find Sex Pistols and Circle Jerks and Black Flag CDs or cassettes 
in Indonesia back then? It's like impossible. Oh. I can I can only get I can only get them by um, duplicating. Oh. <laughs> if someone has the yeah, if someone has the cassettes or maybe CD, I think. But I think tapes. It's uh, like pe- most people have uh, tapes, not CDs. So like, so my mine was like the seventh copy out of the eighth copy. So it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> so someone would buy the cassette, and then and then all the friends would copy it and high speed dub it, right? So if you wrote your name on on the cover, so. It, Everyone has your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's let's talk about this because I know that for me, I, I, my recollection of Acha is always the vocalist of a hardcore band, right? But you're saying that you before Sex Pistols, you were already listening to metal. Is that correct? Yes. So yeah. How, so what kind of metal were you listening to at that time? Do you remember? Yes, Anthrax. Yeah. What album? Uh, State of Euphoria. Yeah, State of Euphoria. Attack of the Killer Bees. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you then su- suddenly started listening to Sex Pistols and Black Flag and stuff, do you remember? Now, okay, now, sorry. Now I remember why I dig into the Sex Pistols. Tell me. Because I love Guns N' Roses. Oh. After the Beatles, I fell in love with the, with Guns N' Roses. And I see Duff McKagan wearing the, uh, the Sex Pistols shirt. Okay. So what happened was that you saw you fell in love with Guns N' Roses and you saw Duff McKagan was wearing a Sex Pistols t-shirt, you saw the lock on him around his neck and that got you interested in trying to find out what Sex Pistols was. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then because you're like me, like I I grew up on metal first and then I found hardcore punk later. But for me the transition to punk rock and hardcore was not easy. It took me a long time to really understand it cuz by that time, I was listening to the same thing as you, Anthrax, Iron Maiden, Metallica, all these very polished rec- recordings. And then when I first heard like Bad Religion or Sick of It All, it was just so yeah. loud and like all power chords. Do you remember what feeling you had when you switched from metal to punk? Well, okay. Um, okay, I saw Metallica and Sepultura back in the early 90s. What? Yes. Where? Indonesia. Jakarta. What? Did Sepultura Metallica came to Indonesia? Hello, Indonesia. Non-conformity in my inner self. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. What year? I... I think that was back in 92, somewhere around that. Well, yeah, it was a big chaos. From, yeah. yeah, I heard it was chaos. Also, Metallica right? was a very, yeah, very, very big chaos. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was early 90s, yeah. Uh, 92, I guess, 93, somewhere yeah. around that. And were you there at the show? Yes. You saw that show? Yeah. Bro, yeah. you saw both Metallica and Sepultura? Yeah. Oh, yes. wow. Yes. Okay, <laughs> tell us about the show. What do you remember from the show? It was crazy, man. It, it's like surreal, unbelievable. It's like, wow. Someone you always listen from the uh, radio tape recorders and then they play it in front of you. Yeah, that's amazing. You, it's, so, it's an experience that you probably never forget, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's yeah, like you said, and then um, and uh, after that, I listened to the Sex Pistols and then I trans, um, and then I started listening to like uh, hardcore bands because I remember back in 95 I saw Foo Fighters Sonic Youth and Beastie Boys here in Jakarta from there I started listening to Beastie Boys like early albums yeah so then when you went from from uh, Sepultura Metallica then you went to Sex Pistols and then you saw that tour right the Foo Fighters tour with Beastie Boys what was the first hardcore band that you remember listening to Mm, okay, I think, okay, back in, yeah, early 95, 96, I think it was Biohazard. Was it a Urban Discipline or what It album? was the Mata Leao, Mata Leao. Mm. I think, I think either Mata Leao or Urban Discipline. Okay. I think, I think that. And do you remember why you fell in love with that, that album? Because I mean, for Urban Discipline was a very big album for me too. But why did you fall in love with it? Because I think the lyric is like, 
it's it's like represented me it's like in a in a way because i, I was young hungry and they saying but fuck the rules fuck fuck the rules fuck the rules wow i was like oh man <laughs> yes <laughs> and then when you found biohazard and urban discipline and those albums uh, did you already have a circle of friends who are also listening to the same things or did you have to go find new friends it's like we walk uh, we go to like malls and and uh, places like that with uh, like high hopes finding someone with music shirts if yeah. let's see if I if I if I, uh, if I see, saw you that time it's like wearing my hazard shirt and I were like hey what's your name my name is Acha where do you live man let's <laughs> hang out together it's like that I have these tapes and uh, what what tapes do you have it's like that so it's like that you know I remember that too though I remember back in the day like in Hong Kong because we didn't have many skateboarders or we didn't have many people that listen to metal but you're right I remember going across the street because some guy was wearing a skateboard shirt I was like yo yeah, you skate yeah. I skate where do you live like I remember that man I remember that yeah <laughs> yeah the feeling is like that it's very mutual I, I have this do you have this no let's stream <laughs> it's like that <laughs> No. Yeah, and then I, I, I started um, like ordering stuff from Revelation or um, Lost and Found. Okay. The stuff, so, yeah, the stuff I ordered was, yeah, I mean, Gorilla Biscuits, Youth of Today, Bowl, stuff like that. That's crazy because when you, were, when you first heard Biohazard, how did you already find out about Mail Order? How did you find out about Revelation Records? Because for me, that wasn't until many years later. How did you find out yeah, about those Yeah, stars? yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I mean, someone someone uh, taught me that because hey, if you want this, you can do this. I mean, ah yeah. So I wrote uh, to the form and everything. I put the money into uh, the what do you call it? The paper with the black something. If you write it and then like it's safe. Wow. So you actually put money in an envelope and you sent it to USA. Yeah. And this is ninety six. Yeah. Wow, did you think that they were going to write back or did you think your money was going to get lost forever? Like, what did you think? <laughs> no, I didn't think of nothing, man. I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> because I really want to have it. I really want to. I have to do it, man. I have to do it. So it's like that. <laughs> That's so funny. Do you remember what what you, what you did you order? In that very first order, what was it? I, yeah, I think it was Break Down the Walls, something like that, the CDs. Wow. And Gorilla Biscuits start today, and Bolts pick up. Wow. <laughs> and how long did it take? Oh, New York hardcore, I think. Yeah. And how long did it take for you to receive your package? I don't know, maybe a month, two months. Are you sure? Back in 96? It was quick? Yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that long. Yeah. It wasn't that long. Because I remember in Hong Kong, like in the late 80s, when we used to order things, you know, because we used to get like Metal Edge magazine or Metal Maniacs, yeah, and you yeah, order t shirts yeah, from the back. Yeah, yeah. It would take like six months yeah, before yeah, the thing yeah, showed yeah, up. Yeah. All right. So, Acha, can, after you got access to all this music, you got the CDs, you got the cassettes, what was the first hardcore show in, in Indonesia that you saw? Okay. The first hardcore show that I saw was a local local show it's 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 not a hardcore show actually it's a metal with punk bands and with hardcore bands in it but then back in 96 it was straight answers first show it's called straight edge the show was called straight edge so straight answers first show was in 1996 yes what so you you heard sex pistols in 95 and the next year you already had a band yeah what? yeah Sorry, man. I, I heard the Sex Pistols was before before that time. Oh. I think it was when I was in high, uh, junior high school. Sorry. It was, yeah. So when you, you know, you said that your first show was a mixed bill. It had metal bands, it had punk bands. Do you yeah. remember any of the names of those bands? Are they still around? Once, I think, okay. Uh, I remember it was Dirty H. Yeah, it's a hardcore band. Okay. And the um, and the a hardcore band with the song inspired by Sonic Youth. It was Youth Against Fascism. That was the name of the band. Yeah. Wow, great name for a band. So it's hardcore inspired by Sonic Youth. Yeah. Bro. Youth, youth Against Fascism. It was Sonic Youth song. Wow, that sounds great, dude. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 
So then, <laughs> so you saw that show, and when did you decide, hey, I want to start a hardcore band? After, right, right after that, <laughs> right after that. So I start uh, asking friends who's not in the band because every everybody has band, mm. but I didn't. So mm. I went, okay, who's available? Mm. Oh, I, I got a friend, this guy, he lived there, and then blah 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 blah, and then started. I went to his house asking, hey, you wanna, you wanna do it? Yeah, okay, let's do it. Wow. So we covered both, both all the time. So your first show with Straight Answer, uh, did you already have original songs or was it was it just cover songs? It was cover songs, and then after that we made song, one song. Wow. So in '96 is, is Straight Answer's first show. So when did Straight Answer actually begin? Also in '96 or '95? Yeah, '96. Do you remember how many months after you started the band you okay. played your first show? I think I think it was a very short period. I think about two, three months. Wow. Because we were like, all right, let's do it, man. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's so yeah. cool. So your other members of Straight Answer back in '96, they were already listening to hardcore punk, or were they metalheads that you kind of just brought in? Uh, the guitarist Hugo, the, or the original one, he already listened to metal in the early '90s. He started uh, in a band by, uh, as a vocalist. He he covered Napalm Death, Suffocation, back in the '92, I think '93, yeah. So he met me, and then we formed Sweet Answer. And he's still a metalhead until now. <laughs> So you, you you didn't do a very good job converting him. <laughs> no, and the basis he uh, he he also lives uh, he's older than me, and he already listened to hardcore punk band like he loves like bands like Crumb Suckers, Circle Jerks, Black Flag, yeah, bands like that, like crossover bands. Yeah, he loved it. And the drummer he's younger, and then he started. Listen to hardcore like like Euro hardcore bands like Griffiths, um, Rikers. But his favorite was like, I think it was Youth of Today. Instead, bands like that. Wow, I yeah. can't believe you were able to find band members like that in the '90s. Because even now in 2020 in Hong Kong, I wouldn't be able to find band members like that. <laughs> <laughs> So it really sounds like Acha, like in the '90s, the the hardcore scene and the hardcore understanding, the education that people already had for hardcore punk rock was huge in Indonesia. Yes, yeah. I mean, that time I remember, like I moshed to every songs. Like even I didn't know who's the singer or what the song is. Now, when you started playing your first show, your with Straight Answer, what were the other hardcore bands in that era of Straight Answer '96? Yeah, it's. Uh, like I said, it, it was the bands that I saw earlier. It was okay. It was okay. There was one band from Bandung. It's called Blind to See. And then, yeah, Dirty Edge. They're still playing until now. And then I remember Front Side. I remember again, yeah, yeah, Youth Against Fascism. And then I remember Warning X. And then I remember Full of Shit. It's like everybody's, co uh, everybody's covering another bands. <laughs> but we are like, oh, if we wanted, if we wanted, if we wanted to do sick of it all, but uh, it's full of shit, it's already doing it. So we uh, we have to do another band. <laughs> okay, let's do Youth of the Day. Wow, but Youth of the Day, Blind to See has already did that. So uh, we let's find another one. <laughs> so it's like that. So we covered both. That's crazy, man. <laughs> That's so funny that you had all these bands back then, but you all your all your bands were doing cover songs. That's so funny. So yes. then, so now tell us, because I mean, you've seen um, Straight Answers been around since 1996, and it's 2020 now. So you've seen Indonesian hardcore scene just explode. I mean, you've seen it already from the very beginning, which is already big, but now the the Indonesian hardcore scene is like in every town, every city, all over the country. Yeah. Could you imagine that back in the 90s that that was going to happen beyond Jakarta? No man, <laughs> no, no. I didn't think it was like going to be like this big, but it was. I think it was bigger back three, four years ago. Oh. It was super big oh. that time, super big. Like every district, every block, <laughs> you will you will see hardcore. Yeah, you will see someone with hardcore shirts. Oh, so you see like you feel like it's gone down a little bit. Yeah, I oh, think it's okay. like that. 
everybody's listening listen to indie music folk music now shoegaze bro shoegaze dream pop every <laughs> every hardcore band has got a side project now right a shoegaze side project <laughs> yeah <laughs> now when you uh, back in the 90s what was the first international hardcore band i think you were saying you were trying to remember what it was yeah hmm okay okay the first international bands that i saw was i okay let's the the metal bands but i think the the first hardcore band that i saw was bc boys oh yeah so you mean the bc boys the foo fighters tour and yeah. did, did they play any any of the punk stuff or were they doing like license to ill and stuff yes. great on mojo oh. hey, great on, yeah i went eight totally nuts man that time <laughs> <laughs> so that was your yeah. first experience and do you remember why it was such a strong experience for you because you still remember it today in 2020 you're still excited about it yeah yeah i mean because i mean for me i think the spirit was wow overwhelming it's so big it's like everyone got uh got struck by the power of that music so it's like wow it was amazing. So, oh, see, this is hardcore. I mean, they're energetic. The music was like, right. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so this is it, man. I want to do it. So it's like that. So, so would you say that that experience of that show really was one of the biggest inspirations for you to start and get more involved in hardcore? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Beastie Boys, yeah. huh? Yeah. Beastie Boys. Wow. Yes. That's sick, dude. Now, when you started writing songs, I mean, I know you said that you were, you know, you were raised on more like Bold, Youth of Today, Gorilla Biscuits, and I feel yeah. like Straight Answer in 2020 still sounds like that, right? It still has a Gorilla Biscuits feel, very punk, very sing-alongs, big sing-alongs. So back then, why did you choose to do this kind of hardcore and not like the Biohazard style of hardcore? Because, I mean, me and, and the boys of Straight Answer, like, Every time we we listen to music, like every time we listen to uh, Warzone, we were like, right, man, let's do like this, man. It's hardcore, but also punk. Yeah, not that hardcore. Yeah, so let's do this. So it's like that. Like you talk today, it's like that. It's very straight faced, like that. No, no fuss, no, no everything. So oh, until now. I still listen to yeah like those kind of music that kind of music so we uh, we started like okay so we want to do it just like this oh, only like this so you actually yeah. had a conversation with the band members about like what type of hardcore you wanted to play and in and for you guys as a band like the the lineup back then it was bands like warzone and youth of today which you liked and you're like that's the kind of style we want to play but i also know acha about you you love like Cockney Rejects, like you love Oi, yeah. and you love Punk. Yeah. So yeah. how did you, yeah. because yeah. I feel like in Straight Answer, you have a little bit of glimpses of that type of heart punk rock as well. Yeah. So what did you like about the Oi stuff also? For me, Oi is, Oi music is very honest. It's very honest. It's it's like you're singing of what of what you feel. You're singing of what you feel. It's, it's how you live. So it's like that. It's like every day's life. If it's like that, so yeah, you're like you're like that. It's no bullshit. Yeah. I, so when yeah, and when people call it working class music, yes. that's definitely yeah. working class music, right? So yeah, I mean, for me, that's why I like Warzone because it's it's got oi and punk and everything in that. So it's yeah, so it's like that. Nice. I mean, I, I think it's so cool that so many years later, you guys are still sticking to that, even though you have all these lineup changes. Like when you have your lineup changes. Do they ever come in and go, hey, let's go in this di different direction. Let's start sounding like Knock Loose. <laughs> so, 
when, when people come to your band, what is, what, are, do you have any conversations about changing direction, or are you like, nope, this if is the way? If someone we said to me like, hey, let's let's make us uh, let's make music like Knock Loose, I would like, dude, that's the that's the door, man. <laughs> Go find your way. <laughs> You're like, there's the door. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean, it's always like that. People who come in, come go, uh, come and go in straight dancer. They know what straight dancer is like. They know what straight dancer is all about. So, like, oh yeah. So it's like that. Yeah, so I mean, it's easier for yeah, us. Yeah, right. Definitely, it's definitely easier for you guys because you already have an established name. You have an established sound. So it's not like that anybody will join the band thinking they could change you to Metallica. You're like, no, 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 no. You're coming to my band so you will get yeah. to learn and play this kind of hardcore, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it's like that. If you want to come in, okay. Okay, come in. Atra, everyone that I've interviewed so far, you know, I've interviewed people from Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and now in Indonesia. Everybody has said that one of the things that they love about punk rock and hardcore is the whole DIY ethic. You do everything yourself. You don't wear, wait for a manager. You put on your own shows. You copy your own CDs. How did you learn about the DIY part of hardcore in the 90s? Um, okay. I First, I know the DIY thing was from Provan Existence. It's a punk magazine. Yeah, from Seattle. So I the first straight answer demo tape, I, I recorded it with uh, the Double Decker double decker tape recorder yeah. in my house yeah i made it like hundreds of them wow and then photocopied the the cover by myself wow and yeah. you're saying that you learned all about this from the profane existence zine yeah i mean if i mean if you don't if you don't do it by yourself then no one's gonna do it for you so that zine was a very important part of your life then too yes absolutely it yeah. taught me a lot of things took me to different places and then I made friends with a lot of people around the world. That's see, you're also, you're the fourth person in a row that said the same thing. They're like, it wasn't the, not just, it wasn't just the music that was inspiring. They're like, I got zines. I got zines from all over the world and it opened my eyes. It helped me understand a little bit more of what punk rock really means. It's deeper than music. So you're saying the same thing happened for you. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of my biggest reason coming to Hong Kong was to see you. <laughs> Why? Really? <laughs> because, I mean, I have friends there, so I want to meet, so I want to see. So it's like that. Yeah, I mean, that's the cool thing about hardcore punk rock. You're right. You can just yeah. find a zine, get the address, and send a letter to them, and you become instantly become friends. Yes. Hardcore punk is like a village. It's small. Everybody knows each other. <laughs> so, so don't talk shit. <laughs> yeah, no. Never shit in your own house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Back in the 90s, what labels did you guys already work with? Um, it was Movement, Movement Records. First label you guys worked with? Yes, actually it's a punk, punk label. Oh yeah. We were the first hardcore band there wow i'm moving right because, how about, okay but, how about this one i mean i've got this lovely record right here arm stretch right no it says here to stay dude it's your your label <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> my bad <laughs> you forgot your own label put your own record out bro you are so funny dude you're the funniest dude um so okay you know I, I, but I, I made it improve for myself, man. I can now do Zoom. You, you know, remember how you call it? Call me Flintstone. 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 So when I, when I first thought about interviewing you, I was like, oh my god, how is he going to do this interview? He doesn't know how to use his phone. <laughs> all right, Acha, let's let's try to. So, Acha, you're telling me all about this whole DIY, and you learned all of these DIY ethics from reading zines writing to people all over the world and really you started to internalize that this is what punk rock is all about so it sounds like that's probably why you opened your own shop right so can you tell us when did you start your shop in in jakarta 
It started, I think, around eight, nine years ago. But, but ten year, uh, actually, it started in 2010. But there was, I was selling, what I was selling stuff at shows. Uh, I do tables. Yeah, it's like a distro. It was, yeah, it was. And then after that, I rent a place. And then I started to open my own shop. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was, yeah. But that, to say. But because, Acha, Acha, that's kind of crazy because I, outside of Indonesia, I don't know many people who can sell hardcore and punk rock and make a living. That you told me that that's your full time job is your shop, right? Yes. Wow. I'm a labor of love. <laughs> but how how do you have such a big scene that that people can buy hardcore and punk at your shop, and you have enough money to pay yourself a salary and live? Never enough. <laughs> but but you do have a lot of people come up to your shop, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a meeting point. It's like a meeting point, which makes me very happy because I love seeing like new faces, even old faces. Whoever comes to my shop and then, hey, how are you doing? It's like, hey, hey, hey. it's like, it's like a fire. It's like a charcoal. You put, and then shh, it started yeah. to uh, big again. It's like that. So for your me, shop, it's like that. yeah. So for you, your shop is not just a, a place to sell music. You feel like it's like a cultural meeting point, right? For hardcore and punk rock in Jakarta. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 That's a that's a cool yeah that's a really cool feeling to have. It's like almost like back in the day when we had the skateboard shops. I don't know whether, whether you have skate shops in Jakarta now, but back in the '90s when we had skate shops, all the skateboarders would just come there and just hang out. We're not even buying anything. Watch the skate yes. videos, talk to people, yeah. you know, check out the new spots and stuff like that. So you're saying here to stay feels like that also. Yes, yes, yeah. The uh, the only bad thing about that was when you have to pay bills. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, man. So like, that's pretty cool that you've done your shop now for ten years. You're able to live off of it. You know, you're you're saying you're not making enough money, but you're still making enough money to live, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now From you also, but but now you started something brand new. You started a brand new YouTube channel all about eating, which you're so good at. Tell us about this new YouTube channel, bro. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The YouTube channel, my YouTube channel is called Teman Makan. So like friends eating, you mean? Something like that? If you if you want to eat and then ask someone to go, take me. I'm ah, a good friend. I see, I see. Yeah, I, it would be like, Like you'd be like, Like something like, it's like very casual, right? Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Now, what is your focus of this channel though? I realized, and then all, a lot of my friends said that, uh, I love to see you when you're eating, man. You're so good at it. And I was like, really? <laughs> you're so good at eating? <laughs> so so I realized that, oh yeah, my love is eat, eat, and then travel. That's it. Mother uh, uh, music comes in, I don't know, in three or four. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's interesting. As we get older, our priorities change, right? So when you're younger, your priority was music and hardcore and punk. But now that you're older, you're like, yeah, I still love hardcore and punk. It's just not as important as other things right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. how long is uh, who's helping you with your YouTube channel? Friends. Yeah, because we Friends all know we all know you're Flintstone, man. You don't know anything. I, I cannot imagine <laughs> yeah. you know how to edit a video no, and get no, the audio no. synced. So who's helping you? Who who are these lovely angels in your life? <laughs> like yeah, friends, man, friends. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, hey, thank you, Acha's friends for helping Acha and learn about technology and how technology works. <laughs> Yesterday, I asked one of my friends, "Hey, can you do me a favor?" And then he he, he asked, "What? Uh, can you make me an email?" <laughs> he was like, and he was laughing. He was like, "What? Yeah, please." <laughs> I need one. Uh, Acha, are you telling me in 2020 you still don't know how to send an email? I I asked him to make an email for me. <laughs> oh my God, you're crazy, bro. You're crazy. Okay, so everything is going well with the YouTube channel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I, yeah, see, yeah. I see it very successful. Look, it seems really cool.
Yeah, I mean, yeah, don't forget if you if you like food and eat, do watch uh, on YouTube teman makan. I mean, we'll definitely put it in the description below so everyone can get the link to it. So mm. now, Acha, let's talk about something that happened to you that was kind of uh, really surprising. It shocked all of Indonesia. I think you said in 2016 or 2017, yes, yes. you had something 16. happen, right? 2016. Go tell us. Can you tell us what happened in 2016? I had uh, I had stroke. So it's uh, the the uh, the something in the blood vessel on your head like explode. Oof. So my brain was drained in blood. Actually, technically, why? I mean, most people died from that and if they don't they will be paralyzed or stuff like that but yeah i mean if you believe in miracle it's it's like a it's like a for me it's like a miracle for me uh, i am um, still here now and back on stage wow. and uh, i have to i wear to i have to wear helmet because here this part i don't have skull anymore so they took out and then actually they yeah, actually they can they can put it back, but I mean uh, I have to pay again for that. So I said oh, uh, no problem. I live like this. So this side of your head doesn't have a bone, doesn't have a skull. No, no. Oh my gosh, bro, that's so scary. Only skin. Wow, Acha. So when you at first had that stroke, do you remember what happened to you? Did you fall on the floor? Did you lose consciousness? What happened? I f that time I was in my room, I felt like very, very, very bad headache. Wow. So I took medicine, but it didn't work. So I ordered uh, like a motor taxi. I have to I have to go to clinic and then I went to a clinic and then they asked me wh which number they can call. And then they took me to the hospital started the, the surgery uh, right after that oh right away they had to do the surgery they had to open your head yeah wow yeah. so lucky they got to you quick enough to take care of that yes. right yeah 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 wow and how long was the surgery do you remember i don't remember i didn't remember anything actually i didn't remember anything so then when you woke up from your surgery the doctor told you that you could be paralyzed or what did they tell you when you woke up from your surgery uh, I mean, I didn't talk to the doctors and everything. My ex and then the parents and everyone talked to the. I mean, he's a very lucky pastor. Very because you know what? I had two surgeries actually. Oh. After four days, I had the second one. For, for the same part. Usually, yeah, another uh, like bigger part. Usually they took it, they, they, they took out, and then years after that, and then they do the second one. But then this is the, like four days. Wow. Two surgeries. Wow. He's a very lucky bastard. He said. They said. Yes. And and when it was you surreal. when you woke up from it, you were able to feel your body. Like you were still you weren't paralyzed at all, right? No. Oh, no. you're so lucky, bro. No. No. Thank God, huh? Yeah, so lucky because and then uh, yeah, I remember. It was back in uh, September, somewhere around that. And then on November, I went to Japan. When you traveled to Japan, did you wear a helmet already or were you just making sure you were careful? I just make sure I'm careful because I bought the ticket before I was sick. So I don't want to lose anything, man. I was just fucking, man, that's good. Yeah, and then back, that was November, right? And then it was January or February, a straight answer to Europe. What? So like six months after you were already touring? Yes. Wow, you're crazy. Yeah. Did your did your family think you're crazy? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, like, like the same same with Japan. I bought the ticket before I was sick, so I didn't want to lose any chance. So I just let's just do it, man. No problem. No helmet at all. Uh, I stumbled every. You stumbled, yeah, because your balance was off, right? Uh, uh, I, I hit something. I fell down everywhere. Wow. But how about the European tour? The European tour, you had the helmet on the whole tour? No helmets. Even at the shows, no helmet? No. What? <laughs> You're crazy. Yeah. And then after that, I learned 
okay, I have to wear helmet if I want to be back on stage again. Even I saw Cox Sparrow, Frog Row, man, no helmet. Oh my God, did anything happen to you in Europe where you're like, okay, I definitely have to wear a helmet? Well, actually it was someone, yeah, well, it was not on purpose, but boop. And then he, he also felt like, well, something's different with this guy. <laughs> yeah, no skull. <laughs> <laughs> did he did he touch your head you mean? Yeah. Oh. I was like, Dude, what happened? <laughs> oh, I see. And then since then you've been wearing a helmet every show. Even now you're still wearing a helmet at shows, right? Yes, I have to wear a helmet. I yeah. have to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So 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 it looks good that that uh, that you're wearing your helmet that you feel like you're getting better, you're on stage. It doesn't seem like you're too worried on stage anymore cuz it's a long time has passed, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the danger is still there. Yeah. I mean, it's not a helmet. They, they, they call me crazy because it's crazy because I'm still on stage. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, you are crazy, man. You're crazy. Like, I didn't I didn't know that a part of your skull was still missing and you're playing shows. That's crazy, man. You're nuts. <laughs> Remember this. Oh, God. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Especially for you, my friend. You You seem to live through everything. All right, Acha, thank you so much for this hour. Oh my gosh, more than an hour interview. Uh, thank you for do, agreeing to do this interview last minute. I mean, I called you yesterday and you're ready to do it today. You're such a good friend. I know you're going through a lot in your life right now. More power to you. I love you, brother. Hopefully you'll, you'll get through what you need to get through. Are there any Why last me? words you want to share with your audience and your supporters or hardcore kids all over the world? Well, okay. This is what I always wanted to say. Thank you everyone. And thank you hardcore for being there for me, for always reach out to everyone. If it wasn't because of hardcore, there's no way I can be like the way I am now. I have friends everywhere. I've seen a lot of places which I cannot think of, but I will be there. It's, but it's very, I mean, it's like a miracle for me. I mean, hardcore brought me to places, brought me new faces, and then a lot of experience. For me, I've always cherished that, and I've always loved hardcore. There's no way I will leave music because I owe my life to that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the love. Thank you for everything. Thank you. What I need. I love you with all of my heart. <laughs> all right, Acha. Thank you so much for your time. All right, bro. Welcome. That's it. Thank you, everybody, for watching episode five. See you next week. Look at what we've been through. Look at what we've been through.